is it that we can, you know, what, what are the mechanisms? What are, what's our attitude as we go before the man and the judge? Of course they're going to do what they're going to do because they can do it. But, you know, what arguments do you use? What's your mindset? when you go into the court, when you're before the man, when you're dealing with the bureaucracies, what is it that you can come out, having gotten fined, having gotten beat up, having having to go to, you know, the appeal, but what is in your mind that you have claimed? And i got to give you this one scene. Do you remember in V for Vendetta, Andrew, do you remember in V for Vendetta where you had the, um, uh, the letter that they got in the cell and she said, you know, and, and V, and she realizes she was tricked and that she really wasn't in, uh, in detention. And he goes, you realize there was one thing left. After all of this, you're going to take your life, everything, you thought that was it. But there's one thing, there's more than just your life. It's, it's, it's what's you, it's your, it's your compliance or your capitulation or your, your, your surrender to someone else that owns you. If we can maintain that, if we can teach that, if we can advocate that, we will change this planet. And to help explain that, Mark Stevens. Uh, I'm just trying to get through life without looking stupid, but uh, it's not working out too well. I want to thank everyone for coming here. and. Uh, and my wife, uh, it means a lot to me that this is the first talk that I've done publicly and that my wife is able to join. So maybe get a round of applause for my wife. Thank you. And also, like Stefan said, uh, the AV guys, like Drew and Nick and everybody, they're making the, the stream online possible. So please consider donating to offset their expenses. They're giving uh, you the web stream for free of charge. But if you can find some value in it, please go to uh, bit.ly slash Freedom Summit 2010. Is it, do we have a dot com on that? Or, no. No, it's just bit.ly forward slash Freedom Summit 2010. Uh, I would imagine that, like most of the times I speak here, most people don't know who I am. So uh, my name is Mark Stevens, and I wrote a book called Adventures in Legal Land. Uh, put that out about six, seven years ago, and been working most of that time on getting the follow up, which is due out next year. And um, I was a legal consultant. I was helping people here in the valley for years with traffic tickets, taxes, stuff like that, drug possession, things like that, and having a lot of success. And I was going to, uh, I had written scripts for people to take into court, and the, the, they, uh, they proved to be kind of popular. And so I was just going to make those available online to sell, and the book kind of grew from that, why I was asking certain questions. And um, Ernie, I, I may have mentioned this before, Ernie was the first AM uh, radio show host to actually have me on the air, which was, uh, he was the one that, that really helped get the ball going. So I do appreciate him a debt of gratitude for that. And he's been gracious enough to allow me to uh, use his studio every Saturday to do my show called The No Stay Project. And what the show is dedicated to doing is basically the subject of what I'm talking about today, is we're bringing about a voluntary society. And uh, since Ernie had mentioned that uh, a lot of the advertising had been done on a major clear channel station here in the Valley, I would expect that there's some of us here that may not be familiar with the concept. So I want to go through that. And one of the ways that to help get to a voluntary society, I think we have to understand that, one, we're not living with freedom now. So when we say voluntary society, so, well, what's wrong with what we have now? Well, it's not voluntary. It's not voluntary. And... Uh, there's a whole lot of lies, to be blunt. There's a whole lot of uh, confusion that's, that's done by design. I mean, Ernie had mentioned the indoctrination camps and whatnot, where they're teaching these things. I'm not obviously including someone like Butler Schaefer in that, but wow, that landed. <laughs> But uh, there's an awful lot of indoctrination and mind control, if you will, that goes into the distracting us from the fact that we're not living in a voluntary society now. We're all told that it's done by the consent of the governed. And people, they hear that, and it's supposed to be such a lofty document, Declaration of Independence, that, that governments governed by the consent of the governed, but they never really break down how that is not even grammatically correct. How can someone who's governed, which means controlled, because govern means control, how can someone who's governed, who's controlled, give consent? 
It's an oxymoron. It doesn't make any sense. It's a non sequitur at best. It just doesn't follow. So you don't have these academics pointing out that the allegedly the greatest minds of the 17th or the 18th century, rather, who got together and, and wrote this document made it so grammatically incorrect, and it's not pointed out. So obviously, you know, we have a, just a foundation there. There's something really, really wrong going on, but we're not taught that. So I wish it should be enough and sufficient for me to just come out and say, well, why should we have a voluntary society? Why should government be abolished? It should be sufficient to say, uh, well, the means are not consistent with the end. Well, the end of government, they tell us, like in Arizona, is the protection and maintenance of individual, of individual rights or to secure these rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness of governments or institute among men. Well, how is it in place? How is it supported? Is it by consent? Is it by your freely given consent? Anybody here freely support the government? No. Really? <laughs> hell, hell no. Okay. Well, of course. So it should be sufficient for for me or anyone else to walk up and, and convince the average intelligent rational person to say, well, why should government be abolished tomorrow, Mark? Why should we do this? Why? Why is this? Okay. Uh, well, the means are not consistent with the end. But who accepts that? I mean, how many times are you going to convince somebody to be an abolitionist, to, 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 to believe in the abolition of government uh, within just a few minutes? How many people do you think you can convince just by saying that? No, you're not going to convince anybody. It's like Stefan Mullen who had said earlier that it's one of the few things I remember from what he said besides the giant turd head remark that he made. Uh, people just, they, they keep coming back at you with, what about this? What about this? I, and on the radio show, and when I do workshops and whatnot, or I'm a guest on other shows, one of the biggest issues that people have are, well, well who's going to build the roads? People. And I just, to borrow a phrase, um, based on what Scott was talking about. A friend of mine, Jim Davies, who writes for StrikeTheRoot.com all the time, he's one of the guests that's been on my show that, unlike me, Lou Rockwell actually will print his articles, that uh, if you want to end war, you have to abolish government. It's just that simple. But I want to go through some of the, some of the indoctrination that gets people to believe that they are citizens or residents of these states so that they'll keep paying, paying taxes. Because if you didn't think you were a citizen or resident of a state or the United States, would you pay taxes? Probably not. But they convince you, oh, we're here to protect you and we're going to do this and we're going to take that. And so you pay. Well, I had someone call the radio show last night. And she said, well, I don't want to talk about minor superficial things like the, you know, taxation being compulsory. I want to talk about real issues. Like, I want to drive on the road, so I don't want to get into something so, so, you know, so minor. That's the whole issue right there. The whole reason why government should be abolished as soon as society has evolved enough to accept it is because of the violence. So someone who had, who had uh, I knew, she's passed away, uh, had made a comment on the radio show that underneath all of that paperwork is a gun. So if you get letters from the local tyrant, they may start out nice, right? We'd like you to pay this. We'd like you to get this permit. It sounds all right. We just, it sounds reasonable. Get a dog license. So anybody who's gone to voluntarius.com uh, will remember this. And uh, farewell to Butler Schaefer, who unfortunately has to leave. It's good seeing you again, sir. <laughs> But what if you don't get that dog license after they send that notice? Then it starts getting a little bit more abusive. You may get a, you know, an issue to, uh, a, a subpoena or, or a notice to appear in court. Well, if you don't appear in court, what comes next? A warrant for your arrest. And regardless of what Tom Cavanaugh, who pretends to be a state senator here in Arizona, says, when a warrant for your arrest is issued, what kind of force is authorized to get you into the uh, police department? Deadly. Did I hear something other than deadly? Guns. Guns, and that implies deadly force. Now, every police officer will tell you that when the gun is drawn, what are they prepared to do? Shoot to kill. Now, does the cop have any... He's just an automaton. He's willing to kill you. He doesn't know or 
if he does, he doesn't care. <laughs> it's over a dog license or a cat license, wherever you happen to may be. He doesn't care. All he knows is that he's the man, he's got a job to do, and he's going to carry it out. Now, some people say, oh, he's got, a, you know, he's got a family to feed, everyone's got a job. Well, that's ridiculous. So what happens when you start buying into all this nonsense that you're a citizen or resident, you start looking at things not as right and wrong, as, as whether it's moral or immoral, you're looking at it as whether it's legal or illegal. And that is a pretty twisted way to look at the world. And so what they've done, of course, they force you to go into these schools, because what, what will they do if you don't put your children in their schools? They'll, they'll arrest you, and what will, they'll take your kids. So the service is so good, they have to force you, of course, to do it, and they'll threaten to take your children. So you are taught that you are a citizen and resident. You're an American, right? We're better than everybody else, right? This is the greatest country in the world. We have freedom. Land of the free, home of the brave. We've all heard this. Now, if we had a flag, I guess we could, you know, all pledge allegiance and whatnot. So how do they go about doing that? They have things like the Declaration of Independence and whatnot, and they say that uh, the Founding Fathers and all this other stuff. Now, does anyone here believe that they are actually citizens and states? You don't be embarrassed. I'm the only one being streamed. Wow. So everyone here believes that, uh, knows the truth that there are no citizens and states. It's a fiction. Wow. We're getting through, Gina. <laughs> wow. Well, this is something that I have used in one of the ways to get to a voluntary society is I discovered long, before, you know, long ago that there's a way to deconstruct this and use it in court. And we use court as just one prong of helping to get to a voluntary society. And so just to be brief, uh, the idea is that if you're a, you're a citizen, uh, that you are a member of the body politic, enjoying a duty of allegiance and return for a duty of protection, right? That's the whole basis of the power to tax is the presumption of protection. So that's what makes up the state. Well, the government will tell you point blank that there's no duty to protect you. You go to any number, I mean, we just lost about Le Schaefer, but anyone who's been through law school knows uh, the Shaney versus State uh, or County of Winnebago is one of the cases, that the government is not there to protect you, that there's no duty to protect you. And some may say, well, that's an activist judge. Every single Supreme Court, Arizona, California, it doesn't matter. The Canadian courts, the courts in the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, all that's going to be in the new book. They all admit the government is not there to protect you. Point blank. Which is why you can't sue the police department if your car is stolen. Say, well, you, my car was stolen, you were supposed to protect me. They'll file a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim. Like what Paul mentioned when he confronted the judge yesterday. They know, they know this stuff. They just don't want to enforce it against them. So they admit to you that there is no duty to protect you. So the whole thing, like there was a Richard Stevens, who's an attorney, uh, wrote a book called Call 911 and Die. Anyone familiar with that? Yeah, they give it, yeah, of course, Powell, they give, he gives uh, like a hundred examples of government telling you they're not there to protect you. And if that's the whole basis of the power to tax, why are we still paying taxes? So, I'm sorry? Well, they won't necessarily kill you right away, but they'll certainly issue warrants for your arrest and probably take your property, and they'll threaten your neighbors, and they'll do all this nasty stuff. And we'll get into more about nonviolent non-cooperation uh, in, in a little bit. But I started using this information in court. So when you've got these prosecutors... Now, Paul, in his righteous indignation yesterday, <laughs> and you were on the show yesterday, uh, yeah, it gets a little irritating when you're talking to people who are claiming that judges are supposed to follow the law, and then you point out basic fundamental principles from the Constitution that every Supreme Court case, I think you made that point, every single Supreme Court has said this. To have a case, to have to have the, the, the injury, the damage, and the redressability. Well, when they bring an action against you, say, you know, we talked about just to mention the IRS, if they bring an action against you to enforce their summons, do they allege any injury, damage, or redressability? No. Well, they allege redressability. <laughs> we want to, well, we want the judge to do this. Yeah, we want to. But they never mention the injury and the damage. So I represented somebody in the St. Paul District Court, and I'm not an attorney, by the way, 
And uh, the judge allowed me to do it, so it actually wasn't civil disobedience, but what can you do? So uh, the judge agreed. It was absolutely correct. That's what had to be in the complaint, but he wasn't going to hold the U.S. attorney accountable to it because how does the judge get paid? Taxes. That's how he gets paid. So one of the things I was doing was taking this information about no state and whatnot, and I was challenging prosecutors to prove they had a client. You know that probably eight times out of ten, if you walk into court, based on what we've done before, if you walk into court for traffic, let's say, and the prosecutor stands up and says, Your Honor, uh, giant turd head for the state, if you just ask him, based on the rules, to produce evidence of a client, if the judge does not bail him out eight times out of ten, it will be thrown out, or he will withdraw the complaint. Now, you, I know you could say, well, what does that prove? Well, I, we've been able to rec replicate this hundreds and hundreds of times. It's not just me. This has been done hundreds and hundreds of times, so if you go back in the archives of the radio show, you'll hear people calling, and they've confronted prosecutors with this. Imagine that. A guy walking into court who's been doing it for 30 years, every day walking in, claiming to represent the state. He's put on the spot and asked to actually prove he has a client. He can't do it. So I've actually taken that into other areas. You start applying the same thing. What you're talking about, I forget who said it, uh, it's like, let's get empirical is his, is his line. Take what they say and then just question them on it. Let's get empirical. You say that you represent the state. Okay, great. Do you have any evidence? And they'll say, well, state of Arizona. Well, that's not an answer to the question, is it? It's yes or no. Do you have any evidence? So I started taking this and challenging them, and it was very effective in court. So in, like in taxes, you probably feel overwhelmed. Would you know, that, you know, you know do you, does anyone here honestly think that to get an IRS assessment thrown out that you need to go to law school or have uh, knowledge of the tax laws? So everyone here is pretty confident that if they were attacked by the IRS, they would know how to get it thrown out? Well, you don't need any knowledge of the tax laws. The most you need to do is ask the agent certain questions. And some of the easiest questions are, you ask them, see, you don't want to fight. So I call it Zen in the art of litigation. I like to apply that to everything that we're doing. Don't be combative. Don't be hateful. Don't, don't be fighting these people, because they are just people. I and mean, we had a judge on, on, on the stage yesterday. So you just accept what they're saying and you just question them on it. It's sort of like what Steph was mentioning earlier, is like put the burden on them. Hey, get you thinking for once. Why should I be the answer man? I don't know all the, I know, a big shock to my wife that I don't think I know all the uh, answers to society's problems. But uh, you put the burden back on them and things start to fall apart where the most you need to know about tax law to show that they don't know what they're talking about is to just ask them two questions. This is as far as I've had to go with some of these agents. And it's on my website, markstevens.net, and you can hear some of the phone calls. So I guess, well, the civil disobedience was with some of them because I wasn't telling them I was recording. So I, I kind of, you know, just ignored those, those fe uh, federal laws. And so you ask them if there's a factual difference between income and taxable income. And they're going to say, yeah, of course. No, they're not so ignorant they're going to say no. There are no differences. It's synonymous. Then all you have to do is ask them if they know what they are. Does anyone here know what they are? Do you know the factual differences between income and taxable income? Anybody? Who here has filled out a tax return in the last 10 years? Come on, come on, you can put your hands up. You don't know the factual differences between income and taxable income and you're filing a tax return? And you signed it on the penalty of perjury? How did you determine you were taxable income? The W-2? I can guarantee that the one who issued that W-2, if you get with your, your payroll department, will tell you that they are not witnessing for or against you that you are a taxpayer with taxable income under federal law. but they certainly like to use it against you that it's evidence when you have filed a return. Well, we have the return. Okay? 
So the best thing to do is not to file a return. Um, so, but it, in, in any area dealing with these people, you want to treat them with respect. And it goes to what we talked about on the show. It's called the No Stay Project, but we're already stateless, right? Yeah, we're already stateless. We're, we're trying to convince people that that's the truth. Now, do we have a government? You could just shout it out. Is it that cold in the room? <laughs> no one goes. But does, does anyone believe we have governments? You have theater. Okay, but does anybody believe that we have governments? You're, you think so? You do? Yeah, okay. Well, can you have governments without a state? No. So if there are no governments and there are no citizens and there are no states and whatnot, what do you have that, well, what is it or, or who is it that you're paying taxes to every year? Criminal. Well, men, yeah, exactly. They're like Luciano Spooner would say, just a gang of killers, thieves, and liars. But why do you continue paying? Because they have the guns? Anybody here see a TV, uh, a, a movie called Bugs Life? Well, there was a character named Hopper, and I know I've said this before. And he, in his famous line, which is why you know it's really not a kid's movie, those puny little ants outnumber us at least 100 to 1. And if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. It's not about the food. It's about keeping those ants in line. It's to keep you just doing what they want. Keep, they're the ones, the super rich are the ones with all the government bonds that you're paying. An example is here in Arizona, government agents don't have bonds anymore. Does anyone here know that? Do you understand? They don't bond themselves anymore. They, like Maricopa County, for example, has Maricopa County Risk Management. So they take a piece of paper and they write up an insurance policy. They then under, have that underwritten by New York Fire and Casualty. Well, at least it used to be that way. And uh, can you sue a judge civilly? For damages, if he throws you in prison for five years with, just because he didn't like that you were Italian or whatever? No. He's insured for several million dollars on a, with a policy nobody can file a claim against. Textbook insurance fraud. It's, it's basically the same thing as insuring... A, uh, a spouse that's no longer alive or has never existed. So we were able to get a, 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 a case re a decision reversed because they said that a Superior Court judge had absolute immunity. You couldn't touch him. Oh, there's a $6 million or a $10 million insurance policy on him. Can you explain how that's not insurance fraud? And he reversed his decision. So the civil disobedience why are we paying taxes? Is anybody here uh, afraid to pay taxes, uh, to not pay taxes? Pretty much the whole room? But, you know, when you look at bureaucrats, when you look at judges, when you look at these people and you have them on the stage and you change the context a little bit, you change the room, was anybody here really afraid of John, it's John Buttrick? How many people here were afraid that he was going to use any level of violence against them yesterday while he was sitting here? You didn't give it a second thought. You had, you, some of you probably went up and spoke to him. Did you, did you fear that he would flip out and start threatening you with contempt and, and putting you in a cage for you know, weeks or months at a time? Well, the only thing that's different is the room, and he was probably going to be wearing that ridiculous black dress. But that's really, but that's why does the room have anything to do with that? I think what they're doing is they're creating a context to make you believe that he is somehow different than you and me, that he has the power over your life. He doesn't. Yes, and that's the difference between someone like John Buttrick or George Bush and just the lunatic that you see in the movies, 
you know, mumbling to himself in Manhattan. <laughs> the difference is George Bush and these bureaucrats and tyrants have people who are sociopaths who believe that they're judges, believe that they're president, believe that all this crap. They believe all these lies and they're willing to kill you on their orders. Everybody here, I want you to give me 15% of, of whatever uh, property you acquire every year. You're going to pay me 15% of all the property you acquire every year. What are you going to ask me why for? Because I want you to. I want to fill up my wife's account. What do you think? But why don't you pay attention to me? Why won't you listen to me? How do you know that I'm not going to exercise any kind of influence outside of this room and make sure that you do that? I have? Yeah, well, thank you. Wow. <laughs> why do you listen to the IRS people? Why do you, when you get a letter, do you just accept it? They have a big gun, okay. How many, do you, all right, so, so you're on the impression that if, if you were to engage in an act of nonviolent non-cooperation and you refuse to pay or file an income tax return, do you believe that there will be immediate and swift violence against you? Well, not, most of us here are not, uh, you know, going to have that, that, that's kind of a, an aberration. That was not a regular thing. If that was a regular thing, we wouldn't be doing this here anymore today. It would have collapsed in 1993, you know, it would have collapsed a long time ago. There's a certain amount of public relations, which it's all public relations, but there's a certain amount of public relations they have to put forth. That means the reason why you, you, you can have people claiming to be good judges because they're putting away the bad guys. They're putting away the people who sell drugs or the, without permission or, the, or people who really commit crimes, real crimes, which is, of course, like uh, Professor Schaefer mentioned, it's always about, you know, something about property. So they have to keep doing that in order to put up the appearance so that you'll believe they really are out to protect us, but, you know, with the bureaucracy and all this, uh, you know, they just need more money, you know, we just got to get our guy in there, we just vote in Ron Paul and everything will be perfect. Okay, so you just keep participating in the system. But there's not going to be immediate violence against you if you stop filing a tax return. And think about this. What is so important about filing a tax return? What is so important about that that they'll put you in jail even though more, most of the time they've already got the money? You just didn't file a return to get some of it back. Control. It's not about the food. It's about keeping you in line. So the one tool that they do not have to fight against is nonviolent non-cooperation. We have to live our lives consistent with the with the end. Our means has to be have to be consistent with the end. It has to. And uh, Carl Watner of Voluntaries.com, he has up there: if one takes care of the means, the end will take care of itself. So if you're voting, whether it's for Ron Paul or John Buttrick, or who, it doesn't matter, you know, skull and bones A, skull and bones B, it doesn't matter. If you're voting and participating in a system that at its base is immoral, can you get a moral solution? It's impossible. It's, it's ridiculous. And that is why, like, to get back, that is why government needs to be abolished, because the end is not, uh, the, the means are not consistent with the end. It's immoral. So one of the questions that I pose to people, is it uh, justified, is it okay to threaten to kill people in order to provide a service? It's damn effective, yes. <laughs> now, and this is, you know, we go through this a lot, There's people like Steph and I, doing a lot of radio shows, and, and, and so we always get this. And, and I think that before I get into the nonviolent non-cooperation, I, I think that in part of the education part, why it's so important to educate uh, is to, you, you, we need to wake people up. Because I've mentioned on the show, I have a cop who lives two, two doors down from me. I have a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, who's a judge. I know, I know. <laughs> but he's a great guy. 
Is he involved in an immoral business? Well, yeah, he gets that. He, he gets that much. Uh, but they need to be told. They need to be educated. Because, it's just like we mentioned before, and it, it, it's not necessarily... We don't look. No one in here is ever going to personally probably meet George Bush or Barack Obama or Jan Brewer. They're not the ones employing the violence against you. When it comes down to it, it's the cop who lives two doors down from me or from you. Okay, these are people in your community. You know, the story of bringing the Russians in, you know, the, the Chinese, and <laughs> that they're going to do the dirty work, that's really not how it works. The, it, it's the lower level echelon, it's the enforcers that, we, that are doing it. Yes. Oh, we need, can we, do we have the, the microphone? The mobile mic. Yeah, you're saying that it's the lead. Oh, yeah, just repeat that. Re repeat that. It's, oh, I can't even repeat it. It's the, it's the it's top that's the that top pulled. level that's holding the leash on the collar. Yes. On the attack dog. Right, and I, I think it was Cicero. Is Steph here? Yes. Wasn't it Cicero that said uh, that Jupiter pulls a string in all the moons and planets? I'm afraid I don't recall. But it sounds right. All right. So come off like a giant turd head right in the middle of my talk. <sighs> anyway, but you get the idea. But yes, Eti, uh, Etienne de la Beauté, who wrote an excellent, and actually French, by the way, so it's a, it's a, it's a quiver in your thing, uh, wrote the Discourse on Voluntary Servitude. And what he said was, look, the tyrant doesn't have any more hands or eyes or feet than you and I, but he's always got people under him usually the worst of society, that he can command and pay. And what Lysander or Spooner wrote, that any tyrant with some money can pay antisocial killers, call them soldiers, and pay them to plunder you. And with that plunder, he can hire more antisocial <laughs> uh, killers, called soldiers, to then plunder your na you know, the, next, you know, the, the community next to yours. And that's how it grew. I mean, that's, ex that's exactly how Rome grew. Rome grew from a little tiny area and conquered most of the known world. And that's how they did it. So it's very important to educate people on this. And the most effective thing that I have found, and I'm sure Steph will agree with me here, that if you stick to your core principle, meet, look, everyone's got their map of the world. That's just the way it is. We, none of us here see, see things exactly the same, except for my wife and I, which we're, we're right on, on the money there. But, you, but we all have some overlap. And it's that overlap that you if, you, if you can't get the overlap, then walk away because you can't have a rational discussion. So you bring it down to the core principle, which is it is wrong to initiate force or the threat of force. Do we all agree to that? Yeah, I think we, that's why, why we're here. Right. Thank you. An attorney, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. So if you stick just to that, you build on what Steph was mentioning before, the burden doesn't have to shift to us trying to convince somebody. So when they come out and say, who's going to build the roads? People. How is it going to get paid for? Well, let's, is it okay to force people to pay? Well, no. Well, then okay. Then that's the solution. So the easiest way is to put the burden back, like Steph said, of course, and just start actually thinking about it. But people who buy into the concept of the state, do they spend a lot of, a lot of time thinking? No. That's what, that's what NASA is for? <laughs> There's a line from the, from the Simpsons, <laughs> thinking. That's what we are politicians for. That's why I voted. I don't have to think. Uh, unfortunately, that, that's a true commentary on, on most Americans. So keep the burden there. Always stick to the core principle. Nothing else matters. The fact that they agree that you should not initiate force, they're voluntarists. They believe that all human interaction should be voluntary. And so what I bring up, too, to, to show people that you and I don't have to know exactly every single solution to how a voluntary, voluntary society will function because it's beyond the realm of anybody. In fact, so I go to the essay, I Pencil. Anyone familiar with I Pencil? Yeah, so there's no one person in the world who, could, who has the, enough brains to single-handedly make a pencil. So what in the world makes anyone think that me or Steph or anybody else or Ernie could 
you know, expect us to come out and explain exactly how things should work. You don't need to know. I have no idea how uh, a, a TV works other than electricity and, and, you know. I don't need to know. And that's the kind of way our world is going. Do you know how the Internet works? Do you know how the interwebs work? I mean, who the no, But you can use it. So we, you don't need to have the answers to that. The point is the market, people working together like with the pencil, are going to be able to do that. But how do we bring about the voluntary society? That's a real issue. This is one of the things we do to, to kind of like Ernie's and Mark's and, and Stu's vision is to, to get together once a year to see where we are. Where is this, the concept of liberty going? How, how are we advancing? And what does it look like in making predictions? I don't think all the predictions are as dire as Stu. Well, I, I, I don't want them. I don't want, does that, nobody wants Stu to be correct in what he was talking about yesterday. Uh, he's, some predictions you don't want to see. But, the, but how do we get to a voluntary society? I think we have to recognize how flimsy the structure keeping government in place is. First, recognize the truth. Be empirical. Always challenge them. So one of the things we suggest on the show, in addition to education, is because the next step is nonviolent non-cooperation. Now, has this ever been effective to bring about social change? Yeah. Heck yeah. Now, now there were problems because they still were status. But they got the British out, so thank goodness for that. We're still working on that. But the, um, it, it, that's, they were able to be successful because they were consistent with the, mean, with the end that they wanted to get. So Ghani is famous for saying, be the change you want to see. There's something called the bandwagon effect. We're all familiar with this, and it can swing different ways. One of the reasons keeping you glued to your chair when we start talking about not paying taxes, and this is something I do on the show. I, I'll take the lead. I know, Gina, I know you hate this. <laughs> but I make it a point on every show that I do, even when I'm a guest, is to engage in some nonviolent non-cooperation. And one of those things is, is to tell everybody and advise you one of the steps to freedom, one of the bigger ones, Stop paying for your enslavement. I used to say, well, all these war activists, which I'm not, great to have them, but your protests don't mean anything as long as you're filing a tax return and paying them. And now think of it. Put yourself in the tyrant's seat. Do you really care that they're clogging up the roads with their signs about stop the war when they're all paying the taxes necessary <laughs> to keep buying bombs and tanks and airplanes? Does anyone think that's effective? No. They don't care. They don't care. I, I have Norm, I know I feel... Okay. They don't care. I'm sorry? What was... They don't, they don't care. But remember what Hopper said. And every tyrant knows this. Those puny little ants outnumber us at least 100 to 1, and if they ever figure it out, there goes our way of life. So what we do on the show when I promote, and Gina, you were the spot, we have a weekly civil disobedience, the weekly civil disobedience spotlight, and you were in the, the spotlight a few weeks ago, that there's supposed to be uh, a law or an ordinance that you're not supposed to have an open fire. Well, Gina torched the, uh, the garden. <laughs> And I took some pictures, and, and we put that up on there. Now, there was no wind blowing. Nobody's house or property was in any, dam, any danger. It's just like when we had the uh, Dan and uh, uh, B. Randall go and fish without a license. And you start saying to yourself, big deal. All right, you burn the garden. Big deal. It's not. It, it, yeah, but that's the whole point. It's, people don't engage in nonviolent non cooperation, not just because they fear government retribution, they're gonna burn my house down like they did in Waco. Do it because most people have a reverence for the law. But you heard it yesterday. It, there's a there's still with professed libertarians, there's a reverence for the law. Where do the laws come from? Who makes the laws? Well what are legislators? 
We, you mentioned it before. They're criminals, right? Are they, do they deal with people on a voluntary basis like you and I? No. So people who interact on a, on, on a compulsory basis, we call criminals. So, who's ma so the people that are making these laws are criminals. Do you believe two words that come out of their mouth? No. So why would you comply with something that they put down on a piece of paper? Because they have the guns. But that is us here. But when we're talking about bringing about a voluntary society, we have to educate our friends and our family. So one of the things we need to do is we have to kill or destroy, in a sense, the power or the reverence that people give to these scribbles, these, the whims of these lunatics that we call government. Oh, well, oh yeah, come on. <laughs> If you think about it, and if you look in the book, my book, Adventures in Legal Land, if you do not initiate physical force against somebody, you will not break or violate or, or commit one of their real crimes. Because if you look in Arizona, if you look on the homicide, it doesn't say it is unlawful to take the life of another with malice of forethought, okay, for first degree. It says that taking the life of another with malice, so, okay, is a class one felony. It doesn't say it's a crime. We just know it's a crime because taking someone's life is a crime. But what about malaprohibita crap? It always says it shall be unlawful or illegal for someone to travel on a highway within this state at a time when his privilege to do so was suspended. So they took an inherently innocent act. They made it a crime. So what I suggest is, of course, why we say it's nonviolent, non-cooperation, is we are not initiation, initiating the use of physical force. What we're doing is like Mr. Hancock has said for 65 years. You start right here. You decide. I'm going to be free. If you want to be free, it is there for you to take it and live it. Don't ask permission. You want to burn the garden down? Just go ahead and do it, dear. You know, if you want to fish, go ahead and fish. If you want to grow marijuana, go ahead. As long as it's a... Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, can we get the microphone to John? And I remember, as Ernie's walking over, do that. Ernie has said so many times, it doesn't require any forms. It doesn't require a badge or an election. If you want to be free, you do it right now. Yes, John. Mark, the, the issue I see with it is when you look at, like, different societies, even in our society, like, when you go to an extreme situation, it, as in my case, if you've got to go to a court situation, the people that you're dealing with in court, a, a good example, if this was in New York and I had to go to court and say, hey, the cops planted evidence, the cops are lying, the cops committed perjury, a New York attorney will say, we're going to use that because everybody in New York knows the cops are bad, the cops plant evidence, the cops commit perjury. You come out here and people think that the cops are good guys. And even if you show a jury here that the cops plan evidence, the cops lied, the cops committed perjury, you have this, this societal collective thought that we still need the cops. How do you get around that for when you're dealing with the other side, the bad guys, the government, the society? Well, one, I've got to disagree with you that people think the cops are out here are any good because Joe Pyle put that to rest years ago. So, <laughs> but but I, uh, I always go back to the, to the original point, John, and that is, is it justified to initiate the use of physical force against someone? No. Is it okay and justified to initiate force to provide a service? Now, we all say no because we're rational and we accept that. We accept that. Okay? And there's no, there, there's no argument after that. If someone is going to disagree with that point, walk away. You're talking to a psychopath. And I'm trying to be funny, obviously. 
Uh, anyone who thinks it's okay to initiate violence or to provide a service, you're talking to a psycho. Uh, they, you, you know, very little disregard, if any, for where someone's life and property and, and no empathy whatsoever. A good example is Tom Cavanaugh, who uh, pretends to be a senator here in Arizona. He told me point blank, it's, yes, it's moral to force people to pay for a service. Now, I should have just, oh, oh, okay, uh, you're, you're, you're a psycho, goodbye. Uh, I should have just ended it there, but that's what you need to do. Just end it. You're not going to get a rational discussion out of this person. They're too tied to the matrix, so to speak, so you can't have a rational discussion with them. Well, I don't have much time left, but I disagree with you that all of them are psychopaths. I think that the Milgram experiment proves, uh, and it's been replicated, that only 67 to 81 percent of them are true psychopaths. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it's important to remember when we're engaging in nonviolent non-cooperation, I know I don't, I don't have that much time, that we embody the change that we want to bring about. Don't yell at them. Don't mock them. Don't do the thing with the bullhorn and scream at them. Treat them with respect. Because, I mean, like I said, I have a friend of mine who I respect and, and, and consider him a very good friend who's a judge. And I don't see him as a psychopath. You know, so he may do things that are immoral, but not things, all things that are immoral make you a psychopath. And when you're interacting with them and just asking questions, treat them the way you want to be treated, because I can guarantee you, nine times out of ten, you're going to get a much positive result. We have to be the change that we want to see. So what we need to do, and we use the show to, to do this, so the show is like a meeting house uh, of all that we're doing during the week. So what I want to do with the show is, what have I done this week to help bring about a voluntary society and, and lower the amount of aggression that's being exercised uh, systemically in, in, in the area. And so uh, that's what we do with the show. And so we encourage that. But it's always nonviolent, non cooperation. Just take some steps today to stop asking for permission. That's, that's all you need to start doing. And know that there's a community of us. I do a radio show. Uh, Ernie, of course, we know does a radio show. Stefan's got one of the largest podcasts in the world. We're not in this alone. We don't outnumber the status yet. But through things like this, we're getting to that point. Be an example to your neighbors. Because if you go into court because of some ticket you got for nonviolent non-cooperation, and they see you go in professionally and non-argumentative, because this was not a talk where I'm going through court stuff, but you can listen to the show every Saturday about that and go to the website. But when they see you go into court and you just ask some questions in an effort to plead guilty, and they start screaming at you, they'll see who the problem is. It's like my little girls were with me at the East Mason Justice Court, and I'm trying to pay because I was being sued, and I was trying to pay for, to, to file my initial pleading. And the clerk says to me, Sir, you have to file an answer. I said, well, no, actually, I filed a motion to dismiss, and, and, and then, you know, uh, if it's denied, then I'll file an answer. So she got angrier and, and to where she was screaming at me. So you would think security would jump up and say, uh, ma'am, you need to calm down. No, she started screaming at me. Mark, you, you have to calm down. You, you, you have to treat her with respect. So, you know, Jenny comes up to me and says, Daddy, why are they screaming at you? Well, because the people, unlike Daddy, can deal voluntarily with the community. Unlike them, who have to force themselves on everybody. Which is something I got to say to uh, health department officials in Texas. That the real problem was, after the agent admitted that my client had done nothing wrong and dealt voluntarily with everybody in the community, I said, the problem what we have here is, you're jealous that he provides the community a service and the community loves him to a point where you've got no evidence of wrongdoing. He's got not one complaint in all these years of selling poultry to the community. You, on the other hand, are a bureaucrat. You have to force yourself on a community, and every dollar that you have has been stolen. So you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm, uh, I'm out of time. Two minutes? Okay. So... Uh, this is what we want to do. So start taking some steps, and you have Ernie's show, you have my show that you, 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 we can all call into and share these experiences, and start building you know, a community of people who are starting to live free. Because your neighbors are going to start taking notice. Well, aren't you afraid of this? Well, you know what? Maybe I am. 
You know, it's like in Jumanji. Yeah, I'm terrified, but you know what? I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to cower. I'm not going to allow you to enslave me. You know? Uh, so it's going to be spontaneous. As people are going to take notice. I've gone to court and I've had people copy what I was doing after I had something thrown out. So people are taking notice. And when you back down, they are taking notice. They're going to feel, why am I going to stick my neck out for you? No one else is going to. And that's one of the great things of the, what the guys are doing in, free, in Keene, in Keene, New Hampshire. They actually support each other. So when someone goes to jail, they have a civil disobedience evolution fund. So if you do get arrested for an act of, of nonviolent non-cooperation, there's some funds to help fight these tyrants. But I do have a lot of information on the website about how to, and for my book, which we have a few available back there, so how you can be empowered to go into court and have these things thrown out. And so you can go in and ask two questions to the police officer, have them declared incompetent, and have the ticket thrown out. So you don't have to feel that, oh my gosh, I can't fight City Hall. You're not, you just got a cop. You got a guy and a bunch of people who are not capable enough to provide a service on a voluntary basis that people will pay them for. How good could they possibly be at what they do? Right? <laughs> I say people at the IRS all the time, Mike. I say, yeah, hey, what, what are you worried about? He's an accountant. Really? Yeah. How many people don't know that IRS, accountant, uh, IRS agents are just accountants, most of them? Yeah, they're accountants with a badge. And only the special agents carry guns. Now, if they were any good at being an accountant, they wouldn't be working for the IRS. It's just like any no good attorney would be working as a, as a, as a public defender or uh, a prosecutor because what, they, they make 40 grand a year if they're lucky as an attorney? No, these are substandard people and the reason is they, they, they need the security. They don't want to be like us and provide a service on a voluntary basis. We stand on our own two feet. If we don't provide the service that we promise, we go out of business and we should because we don't force people. But I want to thank everybody for coming out. Thank Ernie and Mark, and of course, my wife. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, wow, did you guys get a dose of some great speakers or what? You know, we're so glad to do this, and we do it oftentimes at a loss. And it, it, you look at it and you go, you know, how much of a loss? Was it worth it? It's always worth it because we have months of promotion, months of uh, marketing, months of interviews, months of media, months, 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 months. So that has a lot of value, too, is how many minds you can free. What we're going to do now, the summit is done. Now we have the pre-summit and then we have the post-summit. Post-summit is everybody helping me clean up. No, anyway. The... Um, uh, what we're going to do is Gary Franchi, we're going to all relax and chill and take a break, and I find Gary and we'll get him in here and we'll hook up his computer to the digital projector and we'll use the setup. Now, oh, there he is. And we're going to go ahead and I want to go over, and I don't know if he'll be up here at the mic or may, maybe more productive to be at the desk, you know, and projecting up here. But he just came out with RTR.org as a social network for activists such as us to be able to make use of. And, I, and it's a, this division of labor thing. It's, there's so many of us have so many things that we've done and the resources, there is gazillions of dollars in time and effort and money that goes into this stuff. And, and I want to, those of you that can find a use for it and have the energy, and certainly we're going to be here, to have your questions and such, but if you're not, we're going to use this as a tutorial to try and get this up on the net, you know, right away, and certainly archived and videotaped and YouTubed, and he'll put it up, and I'll put it up, and I'll have it up, on how we can use this as another wave of something that was born out of the Freedom Summit, because there's always stuff born out of the Freedom Summit.